Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll start again. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Port Town Sector Plan and Sectional Map Amendment Kickoff Event. I am Josephine Selva Kumar, Project Manager for the Port Town Sector Plan and Sectional Map Amendment. I am with the Prince George's County Planning Department in Master Plan and Studies section. Thank you all for joining us today as we embark on an exciting journey together. Our special thanks to Mayor Cassinas, Town of Colmore Manor, for hosting the Port Town Sector Plan event. Thank you. Before we begin to start with the housekeeping items, I want to acknowledge that this is the project team's first hybrid public kickoff event through Zoom webinar. We want your voice heard and give you the flexibility and advantage to join us in person or remote. We appreciate your patience in advance if there are any technical challenges as we navigate through those challenges. Thank you very much. Please give me a second. Just when I say technical challenge, <laughs> it has to happen. Just trying to navigate through the next slide. Please bear with me. There we go. OK, so you're going to do the slides? Oh, the clicker works. OK. So as Arnaldo mentioned, we have live translation available in Spanish for this meeting with instructions on how to access the resource on this slide for online participants. Feel free to close out the choose language window if you want to listen in English. And as I mentioned before, this is a hybrid meeting and we have participants join us via Zoom. The instructions I'm going to give now are only for those who want to listen in Spanish. If you're listening in English, please hold tight. You don't have to do anything. At the bottom of the screen, select the three dots that are labeled more. Next, select the interpretation towards the bottom of the list of options. Once the interpretation is selected, you will be asked to choose a language for interpretation. Select the language and you will then be able to hear that language. So I'm going to give you some housekeeping instructions for both in-person and online participants. And uh, for those who are joining us in person, as you could see, there are two exit doors. I feel like flight attendant now to show you. And there is an exit door there. And uh, restrooms are available as soon as you enter the hall to your right. And uh, feel free to help yourself with refreshments, as you could see at the um, behind you, there are refreshments. And while you're grabbing the refreshments, please feel free to let our staff know your most visited coffee shop or your favorite coffee shop. That will help us to host Coffee with Planners to get your input from your favorite coffee shop. If you have not signed in while entering, please do so before the event ends. And there is a sign-in table you would have noticed as you walked into this hall. As you can see, there, are, there is a kids table behind, but I don't see a lot of kids here. One or two, those who walk, no, 
Okay, I see my staff say two kids are there. Okay, there are four towns, uh, coloring books at the back with images from your community. So feel free to color and uh, you are welcome to take it to your kids. Now I'm switching gears to those who are joining us online. So I'm going to briefly go over how to participate through Zoom so you can best interact with us through questions and answers. Please bear with us for this prolonged pause after each slide as we must allow time for Spanish interpreters to catch up. Other things to note, we are recording this video, including the chat and the entire kickoff video will be posted online in our website and the information for our webpage and how to access that will be given towards the end of the meeting. We also want to encourage you to interact with us through Q&A uh, during the presentation, and there are opportunities for you to participate via Slido. Your questions will play a crucial role for us in understanding the priorities of the communities. So to access the Q&A panel, just click the chat speech bubble at the bottom of the screen and select the option and type your questions. We will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the presentation and address your Q&A during the Q&A break, which is towards the end of the presentation. So the questions will have your name and the information is available for public. So please be mindful in uh, sharing sensitive information. So as I mentioned before, throughout the event, we'll be asking questions for, uh, through Slido and you can participate through Slido with us. So if you are using a smartphone, you can just open the camera and scan the QR code. If you're joining us uh, through the computer, you have to just click slido.com to open to the web page. And if you see in the back of the chairs, we have posted uh, QR codes. If I move the slide and if you miss this, don't worry. You can scan, uh, there is a page taped to back of the seat. There is QR code for the Slido. You can scan that. If you miss that while asking questions, we also have the QR code again, so you can scan that. If you still miss that, you can go to our web page and answer those questions. So we got you. So don't worry about that. And those who are joining us online, if you have any questions while taking these slider questions, please enter that uh, through the chat panel. And we are monitoring the Q&A and we'll help you with that. And those who are joining us in person, if you have any questions with Slido or any other questions, just please raise your hand and we'll help you with it. That's a lot of housekeeping, I know, because I have to give instructions for both in-person and online participants. Thanks for bearing with me. Now that housekeeping is out of the way, we can jump into the code presentation. I would like to first cover the agenda for the event. So we will be first starting with calling upon the elected officials and Chair Shapiro, and then we will move to the introduction of the project team. Um, so you will know who we are, and then we will uh, call upon our consultant team who would introduce their team, their role, and what they would do with this project. And then we'll talk about a brief overview of what a sector plan is, what a sector plan can do, what a sector plan cannot do. And, um, and then we'll talk about the most important thing, the community engagement process. We want to hear, we want your voice here. That's the main thing of this plan. So uh, we'll talk about the community engagement process. And then as mentioned earlier, we will move to the Q&A towards the end of the presentation so we can answer your questions. And then we'll also talk about the next steps, what's involved in this planning process. And there are two activities involved for people who are joining us in person. And those who stay till the end, participate in the activities, you have special treats and goodies. Don't miss them.
Okay, so at this time, I would like to acknowledge Chair Shapiro and um, our District 5 Council member and the new Council Chair, Jolene Ivey. <laughs> Mayor Cassinas, Mayor James, Mayor Gant. I know she was running late. I'm not sure if she made it here yet, but she's on her way. Uh, Commissioner Wheatley for taking the time to participate in the event. Other participants who are joining us are um, uh, Delegate Fennel who wanted to be here in person, but unfortunately she couldn't join. She's recovering from her eye surgery. So she's joining us online. Um, and we have a representative from Delegate Williams office, Will Freeman. Uh, we have a representative from uh, Congressman Glenn Ivey's office joining us online. Uh, Jocelyn Drought uh, at large, PGPC, PGCPS uh, Board of Education. And also uh, we have Commissioner Donner from the planning, uh, Prince George's County Planning Board joining us online. Um, thank you all for carving out time from your busy schedule to be here. Now I would like to invite Chair Shapiro to give welcome remarks. Uh, before I start, I just have to take this opportunity to introduce the newest arrival, Adam Ortiz, a familiar face to many of you. Former Mayor Edmondson, current, I'll get the title wrong, EPA, something or other. He's a big wig. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day uh, to participate in this process. We hope that this process is going to be informative, uh, constructive, and also fun. Uh, and again, if you stay to the end, you're going to get some good parting gifts. So please do that. Um, we are here tonight to discuss the creation of a new sector plan for these communities. For Bladensburg, Edmonston, Cottage City, Comer Manor, uh, it's an exciting opportunity. We're glad you all are participating already. I personally, as, as many of you know, I have a, a personal connection with this too. I represented uh, some of these communities for a good number of years, and I'm very, very invested in seeing the kinds of transformation that we are all looking for. So I'm glad you're here. I'm extremely excited for you to participate uh, and participate actively and bring your vision to this. So tonight you're going to meet the project team uh, who's going to provide uh, an overview of the plan process as the staff has laid out. We'll look at existing conditions. We'll look at opportunities for change, all those things. This is kicking off a long process, but that's a good thing because a long process allows for a lot of opportunity for community engagement, for community voices to be heard, uh, to make sure that the community voice is really at the center of the process that we have here. That's what we're looking to achieve. Uh, this is going to replace the 2009 approved Port Towns sector plan and sectional map amendment. Um, and again, the goal is what's, what we can do that is realistic, that is achievable, um, and then get all the necessary goals and policies and strategies for the Port Towns area. I say achievable uh, and I say realistic because we want this to work. We don't want this to be a plan that sits on a shelf. We want this to be a guiding vision that helps transform these communities in the ways that you want this transformed. So very excited about that opportunity. It really is about collaboration. It really is about strong partnerships between the planning department, the planning board, our department of parks and recreation, the district council. Uh, this is how we achieve all the goals that we're looking to achieve. Um, and you know, it, we have a real opportunity to improve the visual character, to improve the economic viability of this inner ring suburb. Uh, so we're excited to kick off this process. Uh, the staff are developing some very creative and innovative engagement strategies for you and your communities. Actually, just earlier today, I had a conversation with representatives from the University of Maryland. Are they here? Here we go. Uh, Sheena, I forgot your last name, Dr. Sheena Arente, uh, who already has some really creative, uh, nationally recognized ways to 
uh, beef up community engagement and to amplify the community voice. And my team is already starting a conversation with them as well. I'm excited about that. Uh, so there's much to do and many, many partners that we can look at. I just can't emphasize enough how critical and important your participation is to the formulation of this plan. That's the most important thing that we're working with. So I encourage you to broaden your network, share this information with families, friends, neighbors, the like. Uh, as many people as there are in this room, we have, I don't know exactly how many, but I'm gonna guess twice as many who are online. And we are happy to have this kind of hybrid environment. It just allows for more participation. So with that, again, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. And I look forward to this process. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair Shapiro. Now I would like to invite our new council chair, Joylene Ivy, to give some few words. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm excited about this process because anytime you're having an activity like this, it's really a great way to put your personal stamp on your community because the ideas that come out of this process have a great impact on what you'll see um, being developed here in the coming years. So to please take it seriously. I know you do because why else would you be out on a night like this when you could be home all cuddled up, right? Watching TV, but here you are and uh, really appreciate your ideas. I really feel like we get the best outcome when everybody's voice is heard. So thank you for coming. Thank you for putting your thoughts out there. And I look forward to the result. I do know that when Peter Shapiro was on the county council, he made it a big priority to take care of what was happening on Route 1 over in like the Hyattsville area. And it was just used car dealerships and a bunch of crap, right? And now we have all these wonderful businesses, we have the arts district, and it's because of this kind of planning and the input from the community. And we can do, I won't say the same thing here because you want a different thing here. So whatever the different thing that you want here, please speak up, share your ideas, stay engaged, and we're gonna make great things happen here. So thank you. Thank you, Council Chair Ivy. Okay, now let's introduce our project team. So as I introduce our project team, please stand up or wave your hands so people know who you are. So we have Sarah Benton, project facilitator and long range planning supervisor. Sarah's over there behind you, waving her, waving her hands. And I'm Josephine Salvakumar, project manager. And we have Arnaldo Ruiz, deputy project manager. Both, uh, both Sarah and Arnie are uh, fluent both in English and Spanish. And we have Emily Letts, co-team member. And we have Linda Blitz, co-team member. Some of you would know her from the NPA, she, NPA grads, if you are, I did see some of you sign up here. And we have our graduate assistant, Mimi Sanford. Thank you, Mimi. Okay, moving on. So when you entered, there was um, a flyer and the sign-in table that, uh, that has like what a plan is, what a master plan is, what a functional plan and a sector plan is. So let's dive a little deeper into what a sector plan is. A sector plan is a public policy document developed with input from community, stakeholders, elected officials, and other interested parties to create a long-term vision to, for a specific area of Prince George's County. A sector plan contains county's policies for growth and preservation for a specific targeted area, as well as strategies that if implemented could achieve the plan's vision over the next 20 to 25 years 
as well as advance the goals of Plan 2035. A sector plan provides policy guidance on several planning elements that impact everyday life. So we'll be talking about the eight planning elements uh, that the sector plan is organized of. Uh, the project team will dive into those elements in detail in the upcoming slides. So what can a sector plan do and cannot do? A sector plan contains strategies to attract and retain a variety of businesses. A sector plan contains strategies that may make the area more attractive for investment. And it can also recommend zoning changes. So what cannot a sector plan do? It cannot bring a specific business to an area, say to bring a Starbucks or Wegmans. It cannot raise or lower property taxes and cannot lead to specific projects being funded or constructed by implementing agencies. So what is a sectional map amendment, SMA? So this is a comprehensive rezoning process also known in Prince George's County as the sectional map amendment which is SMA process, allows for a change to a section of the overall county zoning map in order to bring the zoning of the properties in conformance with approved pl county plans and policies. By definition, it is a comprehensive rezoning of one or more properties pursuant to and intended to implement the recommendations of the area master plan or the sector plan. A sectional map amendment may be prepared and reviewed after or most commonly occurs concurrently with the area master plan or the sector plan. In this Port Town sector plan, it will be done simultaneously with the plan update. So now let's talk about the project boundary. So the sector plan area contains about 1,935 acres and the area generally comprises properties contained within the municipal boundaries of Bladensburg, town of Colma Manor, town of Edmonston, and town of Cottage City. So the town of Cottage City, Colma Manor, and Edmonston are in planning area 68, and the town of uh, Bladensburg is in planning area 69. And the project will cover areas within the plan 2035 established community areas and neighborhood center. So the sector plan area is largely residential, but it also contains a mix of other uses too, like the employment centers, and it also has shopping centers and also portions of Northeast and Northwest branches of the Anacostia River. So our main objective here is to produce a sector plan and a proposed SMA through an inclusive participation process by February 2025. So this plan, as I mentioned before, will be the voice of the community. We want your voice heard. So the community engagement process plays a vital role here. So with that in mind, here are some of our goals to identify and analyze the existing conditions from what we have heard from you, the community, and uh, through the interviews with the stakeholders, and to develop a new a realistic vision and goals for the area in collaboration with you, the community, and to provide policies and strategies for implementation, and of course, advance plan 2035. Okay, so let's talk about the anticipated project schedule. So as you can see in the first line item that is boxed with a little star on the top, we did our existing initial analysis, uh, existing conditions analysis, and the planning board requested district council to initiate the project on September 28, 2023. And the district council initiated the project on October 24, 2023. As mentioned before, we completed the existing conditions analysis. 
which we'll be discussing in the next few slides. And this is also published online through an interactive uh, map. We'll be talking about it in the upcoming slides. We will begin our uh, begin to implement our public participation program uh, through this fall, through the summer of 2024. Drafting of the plan will then begin with public release in, uh, around May of 2025. We will then move to the legislative approval phase with a joint public hearing in May of 2025 and planning board action would be in July of 2025. And then the district council action in November, 2025, unless a second joint public hearing is required, which will then push all the council action to February of 2026. So now I would like to turn it over to our consultants to introduce their team. Roadside and Harwell, our HHI has been awarded to assist us with this project. I'll now invite the RHI's project manager, Sukriti Ghosh, to introduce his team and briefly discuss their roles and responsibilities. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sukriti Ghosh. I'm an urban designer and principal with RHI. We are a planning urban design and landscape architecture firm here in the DMV area. Great to see you all today. Um, those who have uh, come here in person and those who have joined um, online. Um, I'm here to um, introduce our consulting team. We have a great team. Um, as I mentioned, RHI, we're the prime lead consultant. Um, Dina Roadside is here. If Dina, if you can raise your hand if you're here. She's back there. She worked on the previous 2009 sector plan. Um, so it's great continuity uh, with that plan. Um, we are going to be providing, uh, creating concepts um, on planning urban design, and we'll also be helping with the community engagement. We also have a great team uh, to support us. Um, first and foremost, Brick and Story. Um, they will be helping with the community engagement. Uh, founder and principal of Brick and Story, Latoya Thomas is back there along with uh, Regan Carver. Um, there you go, thank you. Um, we have Alexandria Translations helping us with bilingual translations, and Camila Aparicio and uh, Adriana Torosian, uh, they are here. So if you need them to help with biling bilingual translation, they are here. Um, so in addition to the planning urban design and the community engagement, We'll also be looking into the market. We'll be analyzing the market, understand the economics of this area. So WZHA will be helping with that. Um, we'll be looking at or analyzing the connectivity, the transportation, the mobility aspects of this area. There are a lot of connectivity issues about connecting to destinations from the neighborhoods to the destinations. So we'll be looking into that. Um, Code Studio will be helping us with zoning and regulatory aspects. As part of the concept development, um, we'll be thinking about the, the, the new zoning that is there um, in this area, and then how the concept plan can be implemented through zoning and regulations. They will be helping that one out. And last but not the least, Interface Multimedia, they will be helping us to create visualizations so that when we develop the concepts, and plans and ideas. They will help us to create 3D graphics and visualizations for public facing documentations, as well as the plan documents, so that is, is easier to understand the concepts and the plans. So that's our team. So thank you everybody and uh, looking forward to working with you all for the next year and so, and we'll be working with MNC, PPC and the county. Thank you. Thank you, Sukirti. I will now turn it over to the project team to discuss about the existing conditions analysis. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Josephine. Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. My name is Arnaldo Ruiz. I'm the deputy project manager of the Port Town Sector Plan, as Josephine mentioned. We have documented uh, what we have learned so far in a 200 plus uh, page report on an online story map about existing condition. Over the last several months, we have received data, completed analysis and research, interview with elected officials, county and state agencies and departments, business owners and residents, and attended community event like the Hispanic Heritage Month at the public playhouse in mid-September and the Anacostia River Festival on September 30th. The next three slides that we are going to uh, see right now, uh, we are going to present a summary of the demographic characteristic of the area. According to the US Census Bureau, American Community Survey 2017-2021. This is the five-year estimate. As, as we can see uh, in the graphic on the left, uh, most of the homes within the plan area were built during the 1960s and during the, the 1970s. Another significant sample of homes was built during the 1939 or earlier. As a fact, and according to the survey, uh, the area has not seen construction of any new housing since 2014. The graphic on the right shows the number of homes built by type where the single family detached or the one unit detached is the most common. Medium multifamily buildings, 10 to 19 units, also have a high presence in the, in the area, followed by the large municipality building, the 20 units or, or more. Who live in Portland? In the graphic on the left, we can see that 47% of the people living in the port towns are black or African American, 33% are some other race, and 12% are white. Of those races, nearly 44% are Hispanic or Latino. The graphic on the right shows show us that the age of the majority of Port Town residents range between 25 to 34 years, or a 50%, and 35 to 44 years, or a 14%, a relatively young population. The educational level of people over 25 years of age in the Port Town reveals that 33% have high school level, while 22% have some college, no degree level. Also, 12% have less than ninth grade or bachelor degree level. According to this survey, the ACS, the AC, ACS survey, most of the residents within the plan boundary works in the areas of services, followed by management business, science and arts and natural resources, construction and maintenance. As Josephine mentioned earlier, the sector plan is organized around eight elements from plan 2035. These include land use, economic prosperity, transportation and mobility, housing and neighborhoods, community heritage, cultural design, healthy communities, and public facilities. Also, we have placemaking. That is another element that we are using to analyze the plan. But we, uh, we need to know that this is not in plan 2035. This is not a plan 2035 element. Breaking down a plan into this element is a way to organize the complex factor and consideration that affect 
and are affected by growth and development. So now we are going to talk about a little bit about the SWOT analysis that we did to start uh, thinking and learning about the community. Here we share the highlights of what we have heard and researched using a SWOT analysis. Some of you uh, may heard of a SWOT analysis before, but for those who have not, SWOT stand for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths and weaknesses are inside portals, while opportunities and threats come from the outside. Strengths are things you love and should be leveraged in creating the updated sector plan. Weaknesses are things that we need to acknowledge and fix. Opportunities are things that we can embrace and use to transform. Threats are, are things we need to reduce or eliminate because we like to start and end on the positive. We will present threats before opportunities. So we are arranged a little bit to, to end on a positive. For land use, a major strength in, the, in that port town is, is an area where 35% is designated parts and open space. And this support the Chesapeake Bay, Bay protection efforts. Some of the economic advantages include that port towns is near the main regional transportation network. It has a low rate of vacant commercial properties. The majority of real estate is affordable and the locally owned businesses are diver diverse. The housing inventory in Port Town is affordable. The vacancy rate is low and the demand is high. There are currently three independent living facilities and two assisted living facilities within the planned area serving our seniors. The sector plan has a variety, variety of public facilities, including a new library, whose ribbon cutting ceremony was held last November 1st. It also offers a generous number of parks, shared use paths, and green spaces. As for transportation and mobility, there are several bus lines from Wamara, Metrobus, and DPW and T, and T the bus serving port towns. The area is also served by the county call a bus transportation service. In addition, Bladensburg, Cora City, and Colmar Manor provide their own call a bus service. For pedestrian, the sector plan is also served by Sherry's Path, and most streets in the community are served by sidewalks. Also, in 2009, the town of Edmondston became the first municipality to install a green street in Maryland. Regarding natural environment, congratulations. <laughs> Regarding natural environment, we noticed that a significant portion of Port Towns is part of the county's green infrastructure network, an interconnected network of important natural areas. In 2022, the construction phase of the Anacostia Watershed Restoration Project began. This project aims to restore a segment of the watershed within Prince George County that has suffered from years of environmental neglect. As for community, heritage, culture, and design, the areas of Bradensburg, Edmondston, Colmer Manor, and Cara City has a strong connection to the history of early America, its art and culture. Evidence of this can be seen in the number of buildings, historical sites, murals, and sculptures. Its population is diverse, and a notable art artistic community is concentrated there. When we consider healthy communities, we look to assess 
to things like parks, recreation, and healthy foods. Because much of this land use is designated as park and open space, port towns provide access to parks, rivers, a waterfront, as well as an extensive network of bicycle and pedestrian trails. There is also a strong presence of healthy food retailer in the area. So what we are missing, now we would like to know from you what we are missing in what we have discussed so far about the strength of the area. You can participate by placing your comment either through Slido or directly into the chat box. So you can go into the Slido and type the uh, code portals and you can put your comments to see what it comes. Oh, wow. Okay, we have the first one. Entertainment. So we are missing entertainment. Four towns. Okay, economic development. More pedestrian walkways. Technology and coffee bar. Nice. Except for eco city farm. No health, healthy, I can see, no healthy food. Okay, wow. Better quality option for healthy food. Okay, I think this is beginning to stand out, the healthy foods. Connected to Ana Acostia Trail. Okay, economic development. I seems that it's taking the lead. Economic de development seems to be taking the lead. All right. Thank you for your participation in this first survey. It was extremely interesting uh, for us to have your responses that will help us to uh, better understanding your needs. And now I will turn it over to Emily. Okay. Oh my goodness, you're so tall. Height is not the issue. It's, it's him. <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. I am Emily Lutz, and I will be going over um, weaknesses and threats for port towns. But as we mentioned earlier, um, we will end this on a positive note. Um, so based on data and feedback we collected, we have identified the following weaknesses for the area. When considering land use in port towns, we think about the significant open spaces, but much of this area is actually located next to the Anacostia River, rather than being integrated into residential areas. So what we heard from the community is that to access the, um, their favorite amenities such as Bladenburg Waterfront Park or trails along the river, they need to take a car or bus ride to get there, rather than a short walk from their home. Um, as we mentioned, economics prosperity is a goal to create a diverse and innovative, regionally competitive economy that generates a wide range of well-paying jobs. Um, in comparison to Washington, D.C., Port Towns is at somewhat of a disadvantage um, because developers can receive a higher return on investment and higher rental rates out, um, outside of the Port Town areas. So this results in private investment happening outside of port towns. And within the plan boundary, we're seeing um, a lack of real estate variety and fewer new buildings. Um, this is a good segue into housing um, because while old, older homes are more affordable up front, they often come associated with higher maintenance costs. So we categorize this as a weakness because what we heard from the community is that aging in place is a top priority here. Um, so when we think of seniors on fixed incomes, they'll be faced with costs to retrofit their home as they grow older, but they'll also be facing costs of really high repairs and maintenance. Um, in planning, we define affordability as spending no more than a third of your income on housing related costs. 
So obviously this is something we'll wanna monitor, um, especially for our senior citizens on the fixed in income. So now let's talk about public facilities and more specifically schools. Uh, Prince George's County's public school is the third oldest collection of school facilities in the state of Maryland with an average building age of 38 years. Um, a recent study found that approximately $8 billion is needed to modernize the school system. But not only is there an aging infrastructure, uh, our schools are overcrowded. So it's estimated that for the next eight years, the schools serving port towns will continue to be overcrowded until we can modernize and expand the school facility system. So moving on to transportation, um, pun intended, Port Towns is well located within the Washington DC area with easy access to the Capitol Beltway and Maryland state routes. But these routes were designed for the fast and efficient movement of vehicles, um, resulting in the area acting as an auto oriented pass through town. So during our outreach, we heard that um, it's been really a nightmare for residents to get around, whether it's to go to an amenity or a service in the evenings or in the mornings, because it's just a gridlock of cars. And I don't know, maybe some of you experienced that on your way over here <laughs> between 5 and 6 p.m. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that's one of the reasons we've uh, acknowledged that as a weakness. Um, when considering the natural environment, our attention focused on flooding. I think this was the top concern that I've heard from residents uh, as I've gone to community events. So 17% of the area um, is located within the 100 year floodplain and 39% um, is covered with some type of impervious surface like a road, a building or a parking lot. And so why that matters is because impervious surfaces prevent the natural soaking of rainwater into the ground. Um, so if not addressed, it can really become a larger problem. So another common theme that we heard uh, related to community culture and design during our outreach was that the plan area does not have a marketable brand or identity. So this coupled with a car centric design layout has really strengthened the area's recognition as a commuter pass through town. But what we did here is that members of the community desire to highlight Port Town's uniqueness. So it's clear to everyone, not just the people that live here, why this place is so great. Um, lastly, when we looked at healthy communities, we used the University of Maryland's environmental justice screening tools, which assesses environmental justice risks within the state. So this tool put Port Towns as a high risk area for environmental hazards. And what that means is that um, living in that while living in the area, um, you have a higher chance of being exposed to certain pollutants. So this is really important that we monitor this because not only do we want this to be a safe and healthy community for us now, but for future generations to come. So this was just a highlight of some of the weaknesses that we identified during our research but I would love to hear from all of you what you think are um, weaknesses that we've missed or that you would like to highlight. What? Um. <laughs> well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I guess, I don't know if you wanted to talk to that, but we do have multiple ways of outreach for the community. So while this is one way that we're asking for feedback, um, we will be going through other channels to try and reach um, populations that are not here today. That's amazing of our community engagement. We want to make sure that we hear your voice. So we do know that is a, a majority of Spanish speaking population here. That's why we work closely with the towns and try to do outreach through the towns so that they can reach to the community. So this is not one and done deal. We have like a lot of open houses and workshops coming. This is just the kickoff. So uh, spread the word and we have our web page. Please ask your neighbors and friends to come bring them to our next open house and Thank you, and we'll work towards it to bring them more in the upcoming meetings. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating in the Slido. Um, Ugly Corridor seems to be the winner here. Um, procrastination is another one. So I look forward to going through and reading these later. Um, <laughs> ooh, branding is a good one potholes. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff here. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to threats. So the weaknesses just discussed have multiple solutions that could become assets to this community, but it will take time, money, and consensus among multiple parties on what that right solution is. So it's really important that we identify the threats to port towns so we can um, learn and adapt and become a more resilient area. So as I mentioned earlier, um, in the weaknesses section for economic prosperity, uh, other areas have a higher return on investment for developers, um, which incentivizes new projects outside of port towns. Additionally, Port Towns is not ranked as highly um, as other areas in Prince George's County for strategic public funding. And why this is really important is because um, both of these factors may hinder or delay the wanted growth that we, that we wanna see. So for example, we heard we want greater connectivity to nature in our residential areas, or we want a variety of housing options and for aging in place. Well, all of these wanted growth or desired growth um, requires both public and private funding. So as planners, we try to predict an unknown future, which is a challenging task to get right. Um, we constantly are reflecting to see if the past assumptions that we made still hold true today, or um, if we need to kind of pivot to a new normal. So as I mentioned earlier, the county's public facility schools will require a significant financial investment. Um, but during the pandemic, we saw skyrocketing construction costs and supply um, issues. So it's important that we are in a continually monitoring to say, are we where we thought we were gonna be? And if not, how do we get there? Um, this is the same for the natural environment as well. So we're grappling with a new normal of a higher frequency of extreme rain events from climate change, um, which can really exacerbate the already existing flooding problems. So older infrastructure or older storm infrastructure made 50 plus years ago may not have a, um, originally accounted for the new rainfall normal that we see today. So it's important to um, reflect and potentially uh, look at retrofitting our current structures um, to accommodate this new change in weather patterns. 
And the better that we get at acknowledging and finding these emerging threats and adapting, the more resilient we will become. For community culture and design, we not only heard of, but saw some of the artistic talent in Port Towns through murals and dances at cultural events. This area has a diverse history of heritage and um, the, the idea of creating a cultural arts district has already come up, but we'll wanna be mindful because it'll be somewhat challenging to create a unique one when there's so many, um, so many art districts already in place nearby. So we'll really want to focus on how do we differentiate poor towns so it's successful. Um, lastly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we found um, empty grocery store shelves and more of our neighbors who needed help from food pantries and food banks. Um, and we really saw how fragile our global food system is. So while the height of the pandemic has passed, the Threats remain to uh, maintaining a healthy community from extreme weather events, disease outbreaks, supply chain disruptions, and higher food costs. So that was a brief highlight of some of the threats that we identified, and we'd love to hear from you again um, what we are missing for possible threats for, to port towns. Yeah, um, this one or the one before? Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, what does increased residential density mean um, as a threat? So we put it under public facilities because um, as we see an increase in uh, population, our systems like schools, roads, uh, sewer, just infrastructure in general is going to see um, a higher capacity. So we'll just wanna make sure that as our population grows older, or not older, but grows larger, that um, the infrastructure we have in place grows with it. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ooh, noise pollution. That's a good one. Hmm. Yep, displacement. Sex train unwanted development. Hmm. Lack of cooperation. Read affordable redevelopment. Ooh, family businesses being pushed out. Yeah, we highlighted that as a strength, um, just how wonderful it is. The different small businesses that we see here. So that's really important but it looks like noise pollution is really the winner here. <laughs> okay, well, as promised, we're gonna end this on a positive note. I am done being the Debbie Downer here. I'm gonna hand it over to Linda. <laughs> uh, thank you, Emily. I'm Linda Ramirez Blust. I am also a core project team member, and I have the great fortune of being able to talk about opportunities. And there are many. It keeps falling down. I might have to hold it. Okay. Um, starting with our first plan element, land use, along Maryland 450, Annapolis Road, and Edmonston Road, are several properties zoned CN, commercial neighborhood, and CS, commercial service. Both of these zones support the creation of vibrant, walkable areas for residents and visitors alike. From an economic development standpoint, we've made mention of the fact there is a strong industrial presence. Um, and that does offer an opportunity for Port Towns to distinguish itself and enhance its designation as an eco district by creating a niche market in the green infrastructure industry. 
It also provides opportunities to create maker spaces for metal workers or woodworkers. So it's an opportunity to rethink and create opportunities to address things like the regional shortages of electricians and plumbers and skilled tradespeople in a booming regional construction industry. Early on, Arnaldo presented a graphic that showed the types of housing within the Port Towns community. And you saw one really tall bar for single family houses, and you saw another really tall bar for multi-story buildings. But sprinkled in there are other housing types like duplexes and quadplexes and townhomes. Those are things that are often referred to as the missing middle. And there is an opportunity to add more of those types of housing while maintaining the architectural integrity of your existing communities. And those other housing types um, offer a more affordable op opportunity for home ownership um, and aging in place. Early on, I think during the weaknesses or threats, I'm not sure which one, we heard mention of no pools or would they would like to see a pool. Well, our parks department is in the process of implementing what they call Formula 2040. And in that uh, plan, they've moved to what they call a multi-generational model. And those are larger facilities that would allow the inclusion of things like swimming pools. So that's an opportunity to provide amenities to the community that we currently don't have. Um, just yesterday was the opening of the Rhode Island Avenue trolley trail extension. Um, and there are other projects like the Dueling Creek Heritage Trail, all of which help to increase the connectivity of port towns to the region and other areas surrounding. There were a couple of times that Prince George's County Public School System was mentioned. Um, Arnaldo said we use these plan elements to help us organize very complex issues. So while on the on one hand, we realize there are challenges with the capacity of the schools and perhaps the instruction and the cost of construction of schools, there, William Wirt Middle School is in the process of being replaced. Um, students at Templeton Elementary were relocated so that building could be replaced. So PGCPS is in the process of a very ambitious program to ex improve and upgrade and replace its school system. For, for public facilities, um, as also was made mention, Port Towns is designed for cars. But that means there's now an opportunity to design for people who want to get around by walking or biking or using other modes of transportation. And so there are a number of opportunities to enhance the sidewalk infrastructure, making it compliant for those for Americans with Disabilities Act, and to introduce traffic calming, wayfinding, and placemaking, which I'll talk a little bit more about. For the environment, um, there, the Army Corps of Engineers and Prince George's County have recently embarked on a project to address seven miles, uh, improve the habitat along a large corridor of the Anacostia River, which over time will help improve the quality of the river, um, but then also introduce some of the more natural approaches to water absorption and water management to address flooding. But there is a focus and funding available that hasn't been available in the past to address those issues. Every town within the Port Towns community has received money from the Chesapeake Bay Trust Foundation through its various programs and have implemented a number of, a number of projects to help address many of the flooding and other risks that are present within Port Towns because of your proximity to the river. And there is a lot more funding and opportunities available to continue to improve the natural environment. Port Towns does have ties to early America, but before John Smith began exploring the rivers in 1606 and such, there were indigenous communities and indigenous populations here that can also be highlighted and celebrated and shared, as well as our growing Spanish speaking community and representatives. There, while we do have a lot of roadways and um, railways, that public infrastructure presents an opportunity for art, for murals, for making things more interesting and dynamic. And 
through partnerships with Eco City Farms. I saw that made mention on one of the posts. Eco City Farms, Community Forklift. This community has a history of developing relationships with partner organizations that can help achieve the long-term goals of the community. And so there's an opportunity to continue that tradition, enhancing those relationships, growing those relationships. And yes, there is Eco City Farms, and you guys are definitely leading the way in terms of trying to rethink and build local and regional food systems. Um, there is an opportunity to continue to expand that, build upon that, introducing more healthy food retailers, but thinking more broadly in terms of production, processing, distribution, and consumption, and what that looks like. There is an opportunity to continue to improve trail access. Um, and, and there's a, a larger network opportunity within Maryland as a whole, and specifically with Prince George's County. And there are a number of state resources and grant programs that are becoming available. I've just hit a few high points of opportunities. I'm sure there are many more that you all are thinking about. So I'm going to open our last poll in Slido. And so if you could share with us opportunities that you think about, you've talked about, you'd like to see us explore. Ecotourism. Signage along trails in Spanish, more open spaces, summer festivals. This is a community, so far, this is a community that does like festivals. <laughs> you like to party and have a good time. So it's, it's great to see you all get together. We've enjoyed going to some of those events. More entertainment. I think we saw entertainment earlier. Dog parks, great. Excellent. I'll give you another 30 seconds or so. So if you're in the process of typing, finish up. Okay, now they're rolling in. Youth engagement, yes. A lot of things around youth, youth activities, youth parks and events, youth sports. Yes, we are beginning to hear more of that. So if we'd love to have more conversations about that, what does that look like? What kinds of things do they wanna do? How do we engage the youth so they're part of the planning process? Because we can say we need places for them, but they should help us in designing them. So if you have ideas of how we can connect with them, we'd love to hear that. All right, wonderful answers coming in, but to make sure we continue on and get through everything we need to, I'm gonna to move to the next element, um, which is not an official plan 2035 element, but um, we've heard that this is not a destination, it's a drive-through, um, there's no marketable brand and identity. And so as we've, as a team thought about that, heard that, we've connected with our placemaking team. We have a representative in the back, Christina, um, and placemaking is a set of activities that historically they help build a coherent and clear identity for a place and incorporate it into the built environment. Um, and we've begun to think about how do we make placemaking an integral part of our plan making. And then we've only begun the process of just brainstorming and thinking about are there ways and public rights of way to create a sense of place. So as we're going through that, going around Peace Cross, are there things that can be done to make that more noticeable and identifiable as here, you're in port towns now? Um, are there opportunities on vacant lots to activate them as other things, use them in other ways to give people inspiration about what could be? And so we're just beginning this uh, process of placemaking and brainstorming. So again, this is another item where we'd love to hear your feedback, your ideas about how we integrate placemaking into our plan making. And now I'd like to hand it back over to Arnaldo. Thank you, Linda. So our team seeks to engage the community 
use, using these four approaches, recognition, collaboration, listening, and cooperation. Now we will move on to the Q&A session. And again, online, online participants can also write their question using the chat box. So please, if you have any question, this is your time. Say it again. You can be said it said here. I have to adjust the height here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the question was can you ask here or should it be online? Uh, in the interest of time, we will take a couple of questions in person and a couple of questions online because we have a another activity second half of the event to take place yeah Thank you. So we've just done the existing conditions analysis, and it is a two year planning process to come up with the strategies and policies and recommendations to uh, before the plan is adopted. So that's where uh, when we did the existing conditions analysis, I remember talking to you in the Bladensburg International Festival. So we were out here this summer talking to the community, hearing your input. And we were at the Edmonston National Night Out and Anacostia uh, um, uh, River Trail Festival, Hispanic Heritage Festival. And um, uh, we were listening to you. This is all what we want to hear. And we did uh, look into um, environment, history, and all the elements that you mentioned and the studies, but it's not a done deal. It's just the research and the initial analysis that we have done. And uh, please come out to all the meetings and let us know as we move through the each process. So that will help us with your input. It will help us develop a successful plan. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to come speak here so the online participants can hear the question? It's pretty quick. Okay. Uh, are you So the question is, what's the relationship with the uh, state highway representatives? Are we working with them? Yes, we are. Um, we do have representatives uh, from the state uh, who we did contact. Um, so they are in the loop. And we will, as we move through the different milestones, as we move through the planning process, 
we will keep them in the loop and i do hear you what you say about the traffic and traffic concerns and uh, transportation issues here we do know that we will we will work with them and uh, have them looped in the plan so that we can come up with good recommendations especially when concerned with transportation Yes. 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 Thank you for your feedback. Um, is there anything? Okay. One more question in person, and then we'll check what they have online. Yeah, we agree with you, 100% agree with you. Like we mentioned before, Port Towns is designed car-centric and uh, our, when doing the plan update, we look into all possibilities, hearing your input, including everyone to see how better we can provide recommendations so that it is, um, safety is the main concern that we have heard so far. That is some pr uh, prime thing to be addressed. So we we hear that a lot. So that is, and that's the priority in our uh, list of things that we have heard. So we hear that. Thanks for your feedback. Okay, one last in person, and we are going to check what's online, and we are moving to the activities. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, taking this last in-person question. Looking at the data that you showed at first, um, it looks like the about 20 to 80% of the Definitely. I did uh, speak to someone from youth and recreation. I think Mia Kassin has uh, introduced him to me. So that was the main thing we were talking about. Bring the younger generation to the meetings. We want to hear from them. And we do. We did send out email blasts to all the schools. So we want them to be more engaged. So yes, we hear your feedback. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, so the first online question is, how is the pre-existing conditions planning connected to large planning projects immediately outside of limits such as public playhouse? So the public playhouse, they have a master plan feasibility studies. I'm not 100% sure on their timeline, uh, but we, um, I do work with that project manager. I do know they are doing their feasibility study and sometime early 
next year they would have their recommendation. So uh, public playhouse being within the sector plan boundary, we do work with them, with uh, Parks and Recs to um, collaborate our ideas. How are you planning on balancing the missing middle housing development with traffic that will be increased by more development? This is a good one. I like this one. So um, from our in initial research, there are not a lot of vacant properties here. There are like opportunities for missing middle housing, but with any new development, there is more traffic. Traffic is a concern and issue here. Um, like mentioned before, we do work with different uh, agencies and representatives. And when you, when you come up with any recommendations for housing, the impacts on new development is traffic. We do look into that as well. Like I said, we are in the very early stage and we are listening to your input and considering all these factors while we develop the plan. Yeah, please add on. Yeah. I love this question. It immediately makes me think of an image of 30 individual people riding a car. So we have 30 cars on the roadway. But what if those 30 people were instead on a bus? Our roadways are now less congested. There's uh, more movement. So I think transportation and multimodal options for our residents as we grow is going to be really important to plan um, together with this. So that's, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> So in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. Thank you for your questions. You can still send us your questions um, through our email ID and I'll give you the contact information so you can send us the questions. We'll get back to you through that. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we did our initial existing conditions analysis and that is published online through an interactive uh, story map. Um, there is a QR code behind uh, the chairs for the story map as well. Take out your phone. You can scan the QR code. So um, before that, I would just like to let you know that we are still collecting feedback. And if there is a small image here that shows introduction, overview, strength, challenges, opportunities. As you click on those tabs, you can see the findings and the maps uh, related to that. And there are also feedback questions. When you click the overview tab and go to the bottom of the page, there is a feedback uh, form through which you can there are questions on which uh, section was most valuable to you from what we discussed and uh, why was that, why is that valuable to you? And you can also give us additional feedback and thoughts. So when you do all those things, don't forget to leave your email address. In that way, we can touch, by, uh, touch base with you when you leave your contact information. Yes, yes, sure, yes, so here it is. So if uh, we are in the process of creating steering committee, so steering committee, uh, it, that will include representatives, but not limited to stakeholders, property owners, community members, staff members from the municipalities within the sector plan area. So the project team and the consultant will work with the stake, uh, the steering committee right from the initi initiation of the plan until the plan is adopted. The steering committee will play a vital role. The steering committee will be providing directions, making key decisions, offering expertise, and uh, ensuring the community needs are addressed effectively. So they are like a liaison between the project and the broader community. So we have three spots left for community members to um, hop on to the steering committee. So if you're interested, please let us know. 
by December 31st, 2023. You can email us if you want to be part of steering committee. First come, first serve. So three spots left. So you can email to porttowns at ppd.mncppc.org. It's porttowns at ppd.mncppc.org. So uh, our website, there are rack cards available outside that has, um, yeah, you can scan and get to our web page. Um, I'll give you the website. If you don't want to scan, I'll give you the website. You can just go to the website and sign up. When you sign up, you get all the updates. Please sign up so that you don't miss, up, miss our web, uh, updates. So with this, we are coming to an end to our online presentation. You will have more in, uh, opportunities to interact with us throughout the planning process. Thank you for your time and participation. Online participants, we will have our next um, open house workshop late January or early February. So thank you all for joining us online. So while we end the online presentation, those who have joined us in person, hold tight. We'll move to the second half of the event where we have two activities planned for you. As you move to the activities, please feel free to help yourself with refreshments. And I already saw people taking pictures with the selfie frame. Uh, if you haven't, continue to take pictures and don't forget to tag us, hashtag Portown's plan. Please tag us online. Um, so are we good with the online um, Zoom? So while you're logging off, I'm going to give instructions for the activities that we are going to do in person. There are two activities here. Activity one, what do you love and what would you transform? So there are two maps on the two tables behind you there. And there are three stickers, red, green, and yellow. On the maps, there are key uh, highlighting areas labeled on the maps. So you can all orient yourself. You are just going to put sticker 